what's up tribe how you guys doing this is going to be your review for marriage boot camp season <clears throat> excuse me season 16 episode 6 i believe we are well y'all know i'm still behind I'm trying to get caught up oh this is episode 8 so this episode is the episode again if you watch this show you sort of know some of these drills so this is the episode where they dig into people's past and i'm going to say this although there are going to be times when she probably still works my nerves i definitely walked away with a a better understanding of Jocelyn. I didn't learn anything that I didn't kind of suspect about. Well, that's a lie. That's a lie. I suspected that she had been abused as a child. I suspected that, well, we knew she had drug issues. But to the depth of her experience, it definitely, definitely makes you understand why she is the person that she is. Um, but you got a different a different understanding of everybody. So I'm just going to go person by person and, and um, kind of do it that way. We wake up in the morning and, you know, um, you know, Jocelyn is just kind of, you know, she. I think the, the gravity of what happened the day before with Bonnie Bella has really hit her and she is just not feeling it, you know. Um, she's just really, and I, again, she's a mother and I, I, I don't question her love for her daughter. I don't question her motherhood, you know. We see Stu and we see Michelle. Let me say this about Michelle. And I get it. We know Michelle's story. Everybody knows Michelle's story. And I am not insensitive to her story. However, I am out of patience with her using that as an excuse as to why she can't be intimate. Stu has his quirks. I ain't going to say that, you know, he's a perfect guy. He definitely has his quirks. However, comma... Um, he's a good guy, you know, and she's been wanting this. She's been in therapy. If you watched her on R&B Divas, she went to therapy and she was doing, a, she went on a dating app to try to meet somebody and she was ready. And it seems like she found somebody who sort of, you know, again, not perfect, but you know, and she keeps using that as an excuse. Well, I told you about my past. I told you about being with me. I told you what it was going to be like. And I get it, but at a certain point, when are you going to figure out how to accept new love? And I I have not walked a mile in her shoes, so I don't want to come off being judgmental, but it's frustrating to see that this that she can't. It's frustrating. It's frustrating. Um, and I feel for her because I can't imagine, but it's frustrating. I don't know if her and Stu going to make it, y'all. I don't know. Uh, we have CeeLo and we have um, Shawnee. And they had an argument the night before, woke up the next day, and she said that's kind of their pattern. They get up and they move forward. CeeLo's thing is, I don't like to argue. I don't like to, you know, be in conflict. And so, but the problem when you argue and you don't move and you don't resolve the issue is that it's still there. It's still there. It's still the elephant in the room, and it's still creating a bigger problem. So we get to the first drill and the first drill was really cute. It's a little different in the way they've done it in the past. They had the boot campers do tattoos and the tattoos had to be two bad experiences, one positive experience. And poor Jocelyn was like, I don't have a good one. I mean, immediately you're like, wow, really? And they separated the couples so that they didn't hear each other's story. And so, um, we start with, um, Ajua, Ajua, that sounds right. We start with Ajua. She was molested as a child. And she said that the person who molested her also took pictures. He was like a photographer and he, I think he was a family friend. Um, and so what that did was that put her in a situation to begin she what it seems like she began because here's what happened in the beginning for the first exercise they didn't let us hear the whole story we heard part of the story but then for the second exercise we really got the whole entire narrative so i'm going to kind of blend it because i'm not going because i can't remember what was said in the first half what was said in the second half. i'm just gonna give you the whole story so what we find is that what as a result of the molestation what she ended up doing she ended up seeking out friends who not necessarily were the best influence, but she felt like would 
sort of protect her. And they hinted at the fact that maybe she went to jail. They didn't really say she did, but they hinted at it. Da, 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 da. Um, then we heard Styles, um, Styles' piece story. He grew up in an environment where his stepfather beat him, like old school. He was like extension cord, whatever I could put my hand on and beat his ass. And the result of that was he ended up, you know, he ended up becoming a drug dealer. He ended up running with a crowd and, you know, selling drugs and, you know, basically became, you know, he keeps his circle small. He said, outside of my wife and a couple of homies, he was like, that's it. I don't, I don't do no whole lot of socializing with people. I don't really, you know, that's, that's, that's what I do. Um, Miss Chalet, of course, we know Miss Chalet's story, but what we find out with Miss Chalet was that, you know, which I think if you saw the movie, I think they did cover this in the movie, but I'm not sure. But her mom was beat and she grew up. She said her fondest memory was the record player. And she said that's when she fell in love with music, but that also she used that to cover up the screams of her mother getting beat up. And she said it was normal. That is, that was our life. It was normal. And so, of course, when she grew up and she got into relationships and they beat her and her, that's what she expected. That's what she thought love looked like. Um, Stu grew up in Baltimore, which I suspected. And he said his father was um, a drug user, a needle drug user and con contracted HIV his story was of a black box and he said because his father by the time they found his father i think they said his father had been died had been died had been dead for like nine days already and by the time they found his father he was so decomposed that he couldn't have an open casket so all they had was the black box where his ashes were and he said he felt like he never got a chance to say goodbye to his dad what we found out later on through his confessionals and other things was that he grew up he probably grew up in, you know, he grew up in the 1980s, 1990s, um, Baltimore, and that's The Wire. Like, The Wire was not fake. The Wire was real. That is really how shit went down in Baltimore. And he said he buried 30 people that he knew in one summer. Not one year. One summer. And I don't believe that's an exaggeration. You know, those of us of a certain age group, and we grew up in that crack era, we know that in these inner cities, it was real. It was real. So, but what they said was that, you know, he uses humor. They say even when the, because, the, the, you know, the second half was when they bring the kids out. If you've seen the show before, you know what I'm talking about. Where they bring the kids out to tell their stories and stuff. And even when his friend was telling, I mean, his the, the baby, the younger him was telling the story, he was smiling. And they said, but when it was Miss Chalet's story, he wasn't smiling. He was very serious and almost angry hearing what she had gone through. So for himself, his coping me mechanism for himself is humor, you know? And so the other boot campers felt like they kind of understood a little bit deeper why he uses humor, because that was probably what he had to do growing up to work through it. Um... CeeLo talked about, again, he was talking to them damn hieroglyphics, breaking down his, his zodiac sign. He's a Gemini. He gave us the whole background story on the, the twin brothers and this side and that side and the, the, gem, the A and the B and, and how they were in conflict. and da, da, da. He went through all that shit. But basically, make a long story short, he dealt with, um, he told the story of playing basketball and one of the kids spitting on him and he felt like it was a racial attack. Now, he never said that the kid was white. So until he said he felt like it was a racial situation, that's when I found out that the kid was white. Um, but basically, his mindset at that point was, I'm never going to let nobody disrespect me like that again. And then something else came up later on with almost like he wanted to be different. Like, he again, I feel like it was edited in a way that it was certain things that we didn't hear. But what I felt like was said, and this is my interpretation, that somewhere along the line they talked about he was he made was being made fun of for different things, whether it was because he was heavy, whether it was because, you know, he's very stout, you know, he's got them short arms and stuff like that. And y'all know how kids can be. But his attitude became 
okay, if you're going to point out all the things that I'm different, then I'm going to be different. And that's why I think he leans into the, the um, being that eccentric person that he is. Um, so that was his story. Ballistic story was um, he his grandmother. He found his grandmother, and um, she had had a stroke. And he was the one that actually found her. And I want to say he was like 13. He said he was very young. And then from that point forward, he ended up having to live with his brother, I think, or uncle. And then that person went to jail. And then he had to sort of fend for himself. Kind of. He's like the neighborhood basically sort of took care of him at that point. And again, he got into drugs and that kind of thing. And he got real emotional when he was telling his story. He definitely got very emotional. Um, Bianca's story, she said, you know, she basically been raising herself since she was 15. Remember, she had that, that hit record when she was 15. And she said basically from that point forward, like she had her own money. She did her own thing, and she said she never felt loved. And what always bothered her was when people tried to tell her, but you were loved, but we loved you, but we did this. And she said, but obviously I did not feel like it. I didn't feel the love. And so it created this person that always feels, I always, and that goes back to her always wanting that attention from, I mean, from Chosen, Choosing Chosen, whatever the boy name is. Um always like you know throughout the show she always wants him to tell you love me tell me you love me hug me you know give me some attention and that's where that comes from that that constant um um needing of that constant um confirmation of love uh chose this story we've heard this, that story a million times star athlete tore his net his knee up had to figure out what the next move was he ran track, he played football, he thought he was going to the NFL, tore his knee up. Didn't happen. You know, and so, of course, dealing with that, dealing with that loss, dealing with that disappointment. Last but not least, and I saved Jocelyn last for a reason. I started my video off talking about this. Jocelyn grew up basically from a very, very young age being taught that sex was a weapon that women could use to get them what they want. She was taught that everything was a transaction as long as you could pay the right price. You could get anything you wanted as long as you had the right price. And generally, it was sex. Um, she was very promiscuous at a young age. She was, um, you know, um, she was molested. And she was um, exposed to basically sex work. She had a family member, I think her aunt, she said, who was a drug addict, who would get her to go buy her drugs for her, who taught her that, okay, if you don't have the money, sex will get it for you. And you can get anything you want as long as you're sexy, as long as you can use sex as a weapon. And so that is why she is so sexual. That's why she does use sex. And in her mind, everything is about being sexy. Everything is sex. She did talk about the fact that in the past, she's had a drug problem. So she was very raw and very open. And again, you knew, if you saw Jocelyn in any way, shape, or form throughout her reality career, like the fact that she was a, um, a, an exotic dancer before she even got on reality TV, it just lets you know that that is, it just confirms what you always thought. You just got the story, though. And it was deep. It was really deep. So with all of them, of course, it was deep, and they gave them time to sort of decompress and then um chosen and bianca are still on that cycle and chosen is like look i don't know how much longer i can do this like i can't keep doing this this merry-go-round i just i just can't keep doing it with you um so i don't know if they're gonna make it even child so then for the second half, that's when they bring, the, you know, the younger you out. And they actually had taken the tattoos that they drew and had actually put the tattoos on the bodies of the kids. I mean, not real tattoos, obviously. And so that gave them the chance to basically share their story with the people because they had split them up. So everybody got to hear everybody's story. And like I said, they added, they gave us the full um, story. They gave us more to what we didn't already know. And so it was deep. Um, 
and and you can definitely understand why people in situations like this and go through these experiences how they become closer because they're sharing very intimate stories about themselves with people they're sharing a lot of their um you know who they are and so you know basically the, the at the end of it you know um um Judge told her didn't really go too, too deep. But the one thing she, the one thing that everybody sort of told Miss Chalet in a nice way, they were all very nice about it. But basically everybody was like, get over it. Like you've got to figure out a way to get past the abuse, move past it because you got a good guy. You've got a good dude. And no, he's not perfect, but you got a good dude. And then at the end, they showed him talking. And, you know, basically, Miss Chalet's thing is, I don't know if we're going to be together after all of this. And Stu was like, this was a mistake. Like, I feel like coming on this show caused more problems for us than it fixed. And I'm not going to agree with that. I think that coming on the show exposed the problems that even if they had not been obvious at that point, they would have become obvious. I think y'all came on the show because you thought the issue was that she just didn't think she was good enough for you and kept trying to pawn you off. But what y'all are getting to and y'all are digging below the surface and realizing why she feels that way and why she's doing it. Now what y'all got to figure out is what is it going to take to get her past it to accept your love and to accept a healthy version of love? That's what y'all got to get to now. I don't know if you've got enough time because I think we almost done. So I don't know if you got enough time or not. But really... If y'all really want to be together, Miss Chalet, that's what you're going to have to figure out. And again, I'm not saying Stu is perfect because y'all know I gave Stu a couple here and there too. But I really think she's got to figure out how to accept love. And even if Stu ain't the one, you've got to figure out how to accept love from somebody. Anyway, that's what it is. Y'all let me know what y'all think. Drop it in the comments. Peace.